Hello, my friends. I'm so excited to have the one and the only Kate Roberts here on my podcast. Yay, Kate. So excited. Yay. Great to be here. I'm Best friends. Honored. Uh, so Kate has had over 30 years of experience working in global development, philanthropy, and business, and she's tackled some of the most challenging women's issues, including HIV, AIDS, sexual reproductive health, menstrual hygiene, sanitation, maternal health, and gender-based violence. She's the founder of three nonprofits, Youth AIDS, Five and Alive, and the Maverick Collective. And she's the founder of the Body Agency, which we're going to talk about a bit today, which provides a single source for all things femme care, normalizing the conversation around, around women's natural being and eliminating femme shame once and for all. I love that. Did you come up with femme shame? Gosh, I wish I had. That is um, good. I adopted it. I'm adopting it. As of yeah. today, today it's adopted. You're welcome. One, one You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so tell us, like, take us back. What, what went on in your life? What were your experiences that led you to now create the body a agency and to help women worldwide? Oh gosh. How long have you got? Kelly? I know it's a um, big, that was a big a, question. I, was a man. I might have to break it down, take a breath in between. Um, <clears throat> well, I grew up sailing around the world uh, with my father. He was a sea captain on a super tanker, uh, largest ship in the world. And by the time I was 12, I had uh, seen the world pretty much um, going to a different country every year uh, and having quite hair raising experiences like discovering stowaways, hitting icebergs, you know, just crazy stuff. But the ship took me to a lot of developing countries, poor countries. And so I was exposed to poverty um, and especially how women were treated um, in these countries very, very early on. Um, I then um, started a career in advertising and marketing. And that took, that job took me to Eastern Europe, to Russia. And uh, unfortunately, I was kidnapped uh, by Russian mafia, not once, but twice. And that was really my first feeling of, you know, li life takes you in very strange directions. And when that happened to me, I said to myself, quietly, if I get out of this, my life has to take a different direction. And so that's really what happened. Um, and I went then on to, I was able to escape both times, uh, but it, it's a very long story. It's a, it's a whole podcast on its own. Um, I then found myself in Romania, still working in advertising. And I uh, took on all these clients, but one of my clients um, was this nonprofit organization called PSI, which is a global health organization. And we worked at stopping HIV coming into the country before it actually got there by getting kids to use condoms, basically. And that followed a trip to South Africa. And I saw the ravages of HIV and poverty and essentially, that's when I really thought to myself, okay, I, I need to give up what I'm doing and apply my marketing expertise to issues that really matter in the world, not bubble gum and cigarettes and soda pop, uh, which is what I was marketing at the time. So then I joined this organization, PSI. Uh, it's a global health organization, uh, helped grow it. Uh, to a $600 million organization. And on that journey, I recognized the disparities in women's health, um, especially sexual wellness and reproductive health and all the things that women go through from puberty to menopause um, and, and how it was just so inadequate um, that women do not have access to the health products and services that they need. You know, it's one thing in the United States where we are, but when you go to Botswana or uh, you know Eastern Europe or Central America, and the it's it's very hard to come by. So that essentially was the first thing that happened. But obviously, lots of things in between. I will pause. Amazing life. 
I got held up. I got held up kind of at gunpoint in um, Mozambique. Does that count at all? Yes. I got harassed by Sherpa at Everest Base Camp. This is not a competition. Did they try to (laughs) did they try to interfere with your private parts? Well, yes, because that's what happens. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So that counts. I know, but man, we've got crazy stories. And here we are. We all we we all come in, we all come into this work with stories, I think. I I think when you really give your life to service, um, it's usually from trauma, your own trauma. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you talk to therapists and psychologists, they've, they've often gone through their own trauma mm-hmm. um, and it makes you more powerful. You know, some people go through it and sit in the corner and rock themselves to sleep and others just, you know, get out there and roar and get on with it. And that's what we've done. But, you know, other people are not as fortunate. But yeah, I yeah. definitely... I I agree. And I I think there's something about like, once you see something a certain way, you can't unsee it anymore. And it just comes with you for the rest of your life. You know, once you see how women are treated differently than men for literally no good reason than, than the bodies they seem to be born with, you can't unsee it anymore. And then you're like, how come no, how come not everybody sees this? It's quite bizarre. I will never forget uh, one particular journey I went on with our ambassador at the time, Ashley Judd, who's an actress and activist. Um, And we went to India and we went to a place called Rajasthan, um, which is a beautiful, beautiful uh, place with huge forts and elephants. And I mean, it's just gorgeous. But anyway, we ended up in a, um, a slum dwelling um, where these wonderful ladies, all in their saris, uh, were waiting for us to have a chat about sexual reproductive health. So we would go, we would meet with women, with their children, with their families, and we would get their stories so we could come back and tell their stories. And we were sitting on the floor of this dwelling, um, you know, dirt on the floor, Uh, everyone living on top of each other, very bad conditions. And I remember Ashley, we had a translator with us. Ashley said, how many times a week do you have an orgasm to these ladies? And um, you have to imagine all these ladies were in arranged marriages and they just looked blankly at us. And the translator said to us before she translated it, um, Ashley, they're not going to know what that is. So you can ask the question, but they're not going to know what it is uh, because their husbands will usually come home drunk every night, pretty much rape them, and they won't know what pleasure is about. And at that moment, which was years ago, I thought to myself, that's not fair. That's not sexual equality. Why are these women in that situation when they don't have to be? Um, So I think it was then that I sort of got the idea that I would eventually, this will be my legacy of uh, building a platform that can teach and give access to not just products for pleasure, but products that really help us to get through all our different, get through pleasantly all our different stages of how our marvelous bodies work yeah oh that's a beautiful story I mean an incredible story how do you navigate you know America and Britain and these you know we're not perfect countries but you know we're for the most part women can have jobs and make their own money and freely walk away from an abusive relationship mm-hmm. you know when and we're like oh you know should i treat my menopause with hormones or should i not and what lube should i use and orgasmic mm-hmm. equality i can work on that a little bit and then you've got these other countries where we're like we're so, it's it, the chasms need to be crossed before we can mm-hmm. actually even just like explain what an orgasm is that it's even yeah. a concept because they're treated so unequal. How do you how do you navigate those different countries yeah. or kind of what are your thoughts thoughts about that? Yeah, well, we have really uh, traveled across fifty countries, gathering these stories and seeing the situation and. Um, you know, things like 
uh, estrogen, for instance, right, that we need when we're going to go through menopause, it just doesn't really exist in these places. And, um, and it's just not fair, right? Why, why should we here in the West have the access to all of these wonderful things that will help us to sail through menopause or sail through fertility? And then the moment you get out of the, the developed world, then it's a whole different ballgame unless you have money to be able to pay for it. Um, but it's, it's really, it's not just about access to those types of drugs. It's also, you know, access to contraception, access to a, a hospital bed so you can actually give birth to your child in a dignified way with the, with, with the medical care and treatment that you need to have a safe birth. Um, you know, the, it's, it's really all of this. And to navigate, um, it's quite simple in my mind. We have to take a private sector approach to making sure that these, um, you know, medical services and products um, and education is freely available in this, in these places by taking this private sector approach. So actually working with the pharmaceutical companies, working with the private sector, working with governments to fill an important gap and, and really advocating. You know, we have to advocate for and, and be smart in the way that we build these sort of win-win partnerships and, you know, working with people like you to develop podcasts and, and workshops and, you know, translating it into multiple languages and training the trainers and expanding on the clinic services that we have in these countries um, and making sure that we make it easy for women and men to get the healthcare that they actually need to thrive. So it's being smart because just throwing money at the problem is, is not the way to go. We have to build sustainable platforms that can deliver these products and services. And, and that's what we're doing at the Body Agency. Beautiful. Talk to us about femtech. I know it's another buzzword that people are throwing around more and more. What for people who don't know, what's femtech? Why is it so hot right now? And, and how are you involved in femtech? Well, femtech is essentially making it easy for women to have access to education and products and services. And it can be anything from the menopause world to, you know, puberty and, and period apps and, um, you know, basically technology that delivers your uh, needs around all the different stages of your life. And the reason it's hot is there is an unmet need in the market. Um, you know, I, I, I say this a lot, but I've worked over 20 years in female health. And in those 20 years, the word menopause was not even muttered. I never, we never talked about it. Uh, we never thought that that needs to be a service that needs to go to women in midlife, you know, living outside of the developed world. And so there was no aid for it. There was no resources. And, and then when I started to explore it here myself, you know, entering into perimenopause, I had no idea idea what was going to happen to my body or where to go you know were there special clinics do I speak to my doctor about it which I did and got a very inadequate um response to all of my questions where I was like this just doesn't really make sense does she even know what she's talking about you know she's is she just gonna throw pills at me and is that what I should do so so femtech is really everything to do with the feminine body um, most people think it's just about sexual wellness. Uh, that is not the case. Um, it's really everything that we need, uh, with a, with a functioning female body from puberty to post-menopause. Beautiful. So how do we, one of my recent podcasts was railing against a, a physician, but non-physicians do this too, is like, because there's such a void in 
our standard healthcare system in America and in, in the world of lack of information, lack of knowledge, lack of tools to help women. Women are really going online, which is great for femtech mm-hmm. and great for that there's there's yeah. resources, but how do we protect the women against people that just wanna prey on them, prey on their insecurities, prey on their lack of education and have them buy all of these like creams and concoctions and yeah. placebos that are expensive, but they don't, you know, how do we, yeah. How do we keep them safe and, and, you know, educate yeah. that? I, I know I can't keep everybody safe, but I just see yeah. because there's such a void, there's also this like almost predatory behavior on these people. Yeah. Well, the, the first industry that I just adhore is the diet industry. And, you know, that is, I mean, talk about, you know, predators. I mean, I feel like that works on women's insecurities, body image. Um, I mean, it's just all wrong. And they're all promoting the pills, the pills, the pills, the pills. And it's just bullshit. I'm sorry. Excuse my French. It's okay. We speak, we speak French on this podcast. Shouldn't say those words. Um, (laughs) It is bullshit. But women women want fast fixes and they don't have any other way. And they, yeah. and then, you know, society tells them they should be thin and it should happen quickly. And, and they just end up spending a bunch of money. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, I don't like to speak badly of a competitor, but the, the Gwyneth Paltrow, um, you know, my, my, my candles, uh, my vagina smells like roses candle, um, you know, is, is also, it's just sending the wrong messages out there. You know, our vaginas do not smell of roses. They don't smell bad, but they don't, they're musky and it's the natural odor. You know, you, you are a specialist. Um, so I think that um, to answer your question, um, I believe that by starting the body agency, we need to deliver factual, scientific, medically-based facts and deliver it in a way that is relatable, understandable, and, um, you know, it's not, it's not giving you false claims that, you know, if you put this, if you put this cream on your vagina, you'll have multiple orgasms, you know, which is just not true. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, our body board, for instance, is very important to us because, you know, we, you know, we have a responsibility to put the right products and the right information out there um, and, and not lead women down the garden path of roses um, because, uh, and also make them feel good about their body's natural responses to things, you know, discharge is normal, um, you know, uh, you know, all the different things, menopause symptoms are normal, but, but can be treated. And so delivering those facts in, in a, in a, in a, with a medical, with our medical staff really backing that information and then lining up the right products and services is, is, is what we do. I really like that. And I think that's really good advice for anybody listening. Who's like, is this, is this, you know, website legit or is this product legit? It's like, does it come with an equal and healthy dose of education? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, is it coming from somebody who truly cares and wants you to be as educated as you can, or are they just trying to make their you know, quickest way to a billion dollars, which God bless Gwyneth, she's getting there because of the void that is present in helping women understand their body and and find useful information. Well, she's also telling women to put jade balls up the vaginas, Um, you know, and I, I can, I can just feel my UTI coming on now just from thinking about it. But, you know, it's, it's all done through pop culture. And um, again, you know, you step out of the United States and some of those things will just be ridiculous to most women um, who need access to sanitary towels and, and tampons and fertility treatment and just the regular things, condoms, um, contraception. And so the femtech industry has a responsibility to do this in the right way and to both educate as well as 
throw pro- throw products around. Yeah, absolutely. I was just reading, I forget what country, it was a, an African country has just decided to allow pregnant teenage girls into schools. So previously, if you were pregnant, you couldn't go to school anymore. And, you know, I just think like that is where some countries are. And it's like, they're not looking mm. for, you know, they're not going to buy jade eggs. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Because they, you, you know, they don't even know how they got pregnant in the first place. The education is so lacking. <laughs> The education is lacking um, and products are lacking. And so, you know, I, in my past life, I founded an organization called Maverick Collective together with Melinda Gates uh, and the Crown Princess of Norway and the grassroots organization, PSI, which is a health organization. And we had a program in Nepal to literally just introduce menstrual hygiene because Girls were using rags, leaves, even bark um, at the time of the month. And um, what we learned when we were there was there's an old age cultural practice where girls are considered dirty when they have their periods. And so they are locked in the cow shed during their time of the month and when they have just given birth. Because as you know, you you bleed and lots of gunk comes out for a couple of weeks after you've given birth and they are basically then considered dirty. So they're locked in this dusty cow shed. Some of them suffocate um, and they're not allowed to look at them in the man's face or provide food or do anything. You are locked away. And, you know, that's just an example of how different our worlds are and just simple access to that education, both educating men and women, uh, it's so important. Like we can't do this alone with just educating women. Uh, men yeah. have to really understand these, these uh, issues as well. So it's different in every country and we need to be culturally sensitive when we're going out and talking to these different nations and cultures and religions. Um, but the female body works in the same way in every country. Yeah. And I think the female body shouldn't be in cow sheds in every country. No. Well, in Nepal, they're in cow sheds, but oh, similar God. things like that happen, you know, in India where we've got three over 3 billion people, uh, yeah, billion people. Um, we, you know, girls can't go to school because they are having their periods and eventually they just fall out of school. Mm -hmm. um and it's for so many reasons right that there's no place to put sanitary towels use sanitary towels so it's very period poverty is such a big issue that alone is an enormous issue absolutely um so now that you've you know traveled the world and you have your own family talk to us about existing in a sex positive family and and how you model that for your family, knowing what you know and, and, and seeing the world how you want it to be? Well, I have one daughter, she's 11, and I am constantly telling her stories uh, about what I've seen around the world. Um, I, uh, I'm very conscious that her body is developing and, uh, you know, she's got little breasts now and it's probably very soon that she'll start her period. So I, I'm chasing her around the house with the vulva puppet that we call the Vuppet. And, um, and basically sort of talking to her about her vagina and her vulva and what comes out of it and how it works and how it operates in a, in a humorous way so that we break down those barriers. So, she, so I want her, I think every mother wants the children to be able to come to them and talk about these issues without embarrassment, without shame. And I know that my Roman Catholic mother put the fear of God in me when I was a child uh, about anything to do with sex or, you know, I had to start my period um, and bleed before I went to her to say, okay, well, you know, I'm bleeding now and I need something. And, you know, she was horrified and could barely speak and let alone talk to me about puberty and contraception and all the stuff that she was supposed to talk to me about. And then she found, I was 16 and she found my pills in my purse and went apeshit. 
Um, and I, I just think that the one of the main ways that we are going to break the cycle of them shame of any sort is to be able to talk to our children. I know that you have a few children yourself. I'm sure they get the same thing. Um, and it's just so important that we normalize these conversations because everyone is going to have sex at some point. And we have to prepare our children for it in an appropriate way. And we have to be able to talk about porn. We have to be able to talk about online predators. Um, you know, we're all terrified of that stuff going on, whether we're in the femtech world or not. We're parents, we care about our kids and you need to be a sex positive family. And I'm not saying promote sex or do any of that. But you just have to be able to have the tools to be able to talk to our kids about this in a matter of fact way where they, you know, they don't get embarrassed and they listen. And, you know, that's one thing that we are really, really gearing up at the body agency is giving parents the tools to be able to do this. Beautiful. I was actually interviewing a, a woman whose her job it is, is to teach adults how to talk to kids about sex. And she was talking, one of the components she has is kind of pointing out the sexualization that happens to certain bodies, usually women in our society, in our media and things like that. And she was comparing like the Wonder Woman movie that was directed by a female director where Wonder Woman is clothed versus Wonder Woman is in a different movie and she's got a bare midriff. And she's pointing this out to her child. And she's like, why would a warrior expose their most, one of their most vulnerable parts of their body? Why do you think that they would portray a warrior mm -hmm. like that in this mm -hmm. movie as a way to kind of bring to people's attention how we sexualize some bodies? And I was like, yeah, oh, that's, that's a, that's a whole nother level. And I think back to my mom, you know, I grew up with like nineties hip hop and I remember my mom like, you know, yelling and she's like, those rappers, those rappers are so awful to women. Those are horrible massage. And I'm like, no mom, it's cool. This is cool rap. And now I'm like, oh my God, she was totally right. <laughs> yeah. Like the way that women are degraded in some very popular music. And if we don't point out to our children, you know, what's happening? Why, you know, why are we doing this? Why is this yeah. done? Is that fair? Is it reasonable? You know, it, it's an incredible teaching opportunity. Well, TikTok has taken over and, you know, my 11 year old girl is obsessed and wants to look like the girls in TikTok with the cut off little t-shirts and the tiny little shorts. And it's horrifying, right? Um, cause she thinks that's what's cool. And all her friends think that's what's cool. Um, and of course we're all terrified, um, of, of predators and both online and also around the school. And so I'm, I'm constantly talking to her about that constantly because I just want her to be aware. And, you know, when my daughter was five years old, um, I remember her coming home from school. And she said to me, mommy, please clear something up for me. How come a man who says he's going to touch girls' private parts can become president of the United States? Five-year-old girl. And um, I, it just blew my mind. It's just as I was thinking about the body agency and starting the body agency. And I, it was like a sign from God. Um, that we needed to do something about this because, you know, five-year-old little girl coming home talking about a, a president at the time um, who, you know, even said, oh, I could kill somebody in Times Square and still become president. And he was probably right. Um, so yes, we've got a lot of things going on in the world. The sexualiz sexualization of girls, especially young girls, um, and, and the onset of porn and how freely porn is available. Um, I'm not opposed to porn. I'm opposed to the, apparently the average age of a child who first watches porn is 11, which is my daughter's age. And I would be horrified if my daughter watched porn, horrified, as I think most parents would be. So it's also with the lack of sex ed that we have in schools now, uh, it's so important. The, the role of a parent is so important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've talked about this before. Like, how can we educate people about the vulva when we're not allowed to say vulva on Instagram? 
uh, well, you can have a Buppet. Uh, the body agency Buppet is available, which is a beautiful, a beautiful toy that we can give our daughters. It shows where the clitoris is. It shows where the vulva is. It shows where the vagina is. And it also is a great tool to help your child uh, to learn how to put a tampon in. Because the last thing that we want to be doing is putting that foot up on the on the toilet and showing them ourselves, right? I, I, I would do it, but I don't think most most parents would do it. So the the puppet, um, the vulva puppet is uh, is available, um, and I think we literally, you know, we have to do things like you know when your child wants to say vajayj or foo foo. Like we have to start saying early, no, it's a vagina and it's a penis and, and just normalize it uh, with the right words. Um, and the more we can do this, the more we'll break this cycle. I see it as a, a horrible cycle of shame about our, about our private parts. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're not allowed to say the word or you get kicked off of social media for saying the word, there's certainly just shame. And I, I understand it. Like, you know, these platforms want to protect people from trafficking, from being, you know, abused. like I understand why they don't want certain things on the platform, but then when we don't talk about our body parts, yeah. we kind of, we kind of lose that it's a, a normal part of our body. Yeah. Well, it's mostly bots that are closing us down on social media. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's ways around it. You can, you can write Volvo with an at sign instead of the A, you know, there's various things that we can do. Um, but, you know, you can talk about erectile dysfunction till the cows come home and no, no uh, social media is being closed down for that. So yeah. there's so actually a discrimination. You probably know about this, the discrimination lawsuit in the New York subway because they were advertising for, not Viagra, but for a, a, a company that sold men's erection products. And then there was a woman, a sexual health product, and they weren't allowed to advertise. So it ended up being a discrimination suit because they're like, well, you have you know pictures of cactuses <laughs> representing things right here. Why can't the women do it? Yeah. Well, you know, what we've also learned, it all depends on how much the femtech industry pays Facebook and Instagram and ads, right? And, you know, Goop's not being closed down, right? Because they've got millions of dollars to be able to spend on advertising. And it's also about the, apparently it's also about the, um, the range of products you have. If, you, if you, you have a bigger range of like face creams and things like that, and then you sell one or two vibrators, you're going to get away with it. But these poor companies like, unbound and and even even uh menopause companies uh struggle constantly um you know with with ads for vaginismus which is a condition as you know as a doctor but i'll explain to your audience it's when the penis will not go into the vagina physically and it's a massive issue 25 million women suffer with vaginismus in the u.s and uh, a company we work with has a product that really helps with that and they can't do any advertising um but guess what putting the penis in the vagina makes babies so we should be able to talk about it it's how we make babies so normalizing these things is going to be very very important and i listen i believe in in trying to um limit the sexual content that goes out but Pornhub is one click away. So do something about that. Right. Yeah. And it's the majority of the bandwidth in America is actually on those sites. You have mm -hmm. so much knowledge, like, you know, the fact that if you do space creams, you're a little more protected than if you were just like a vibrator only company, like, mm -hmm. like there, to just show like, you know, people can figure out how to be creative and work with the system that we have and keep trying to to do what you're doing. What is your, what's your, I want to ask, this is a two-part question. First of all, I want to ask, what's your message to women, either women in the world or women in the, in the United States? And then the second part of the question would be, what would be your message to the men? Um, let's start with the men. Um, cool. I would say the big problem we've got with men is the ego, right? They think that uh, they know everything. And listen, a, a sexually pleased partner is a good partner and you know a happy wife happy life right um 
my message to men would be to just take a minute and learn, get yourself educated, not just about sex, but what your partner, a vagina owner partner goes through in different stages of her life, whether it be, uh, you know, fertility and the struggles with fertility and, you know, not getting pregnant and it always being her fault. Right. Um, so just getting educated around fertility, what it means to breastfeed, what it means to be a caregiver to a child. And then, of course, the big one is menopause. Like get yourself educated to understand what uh, women go through. And, um, you know, the, the biggest question men get is, well, why why is she not horny anymore? Like, why does she not want to have sex? But there's a lot of other things that are going on that are completely uh, treatable and, um, and just having some compassion around how our, how our body functions. I think we would go a long way. My message to women is um, support one another. You know, you, you, you mentioned about my creativity in building this company. The only reason I've really been able to do it is because I have talked to other female founders uh, to really understand the market. And my whole thing is support other females. And, you know, by women investing in women, girls investing in girls, uh, we will absolutely change the world. Um, you know, when you invest in a woman uh, anywhere in the world, you will see a stronger community, you'll see stronger nations, and therefore a stronger economy worldwide. Investing in women is our way out of poverty. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. This is such an incredibly meaningful conversation. Thank you so much. And I'll post in the show notes where everybody can find you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Kelly. It was absolutely my honor. Thank you.